Today, you're gonna learn why Bacon's Rebellion is significant in American history. And not only are we gonna look at the events of Bacon's Rebellion, we're gonna look at its historical impact on American society and the slave trade. Yeah, the slave trade. So keep watching. Bacon's Rebellion was a brief yet very meaningful rebellion of Western farmers against the government of Virginia, which culminated in the burning of Jamestown on September 19th, 1676. Nathaniel Bacon led the armed revolt against government William Berkeley, and it was really for three reasons. A lack of retaliatory action against Indian attacks in the Western lands by Governor Berkeley, combined with the declining tobacco prices, created a lot of economic hardship, and accusations of favoritism by Governor Berkeley towards the emerging planter elite on the eastern coast of Virginia. While notable as the first popular uprising in American history, it was short-lived because Bacon suddenly died after the burning of Jamestown, which led to Governor Berkeley being able to retake the town, seize the estates of most of Bacon's supporters, and eventually hang 23 of Bacon's followers. Now let's take a look at how the first popular uprising in America came to be. Nathaniel Bacon was born in 1647 to wealthy English parents who had come to Jamestown to avoid a brewing social controversy. So it was very quickly that Nathaniel was able to incorporate himself into Virginia life and eventually work his way into Governor William Berkeley's inner circle. Governor William Berkeley had served as a governor of Jamestown from 1641 to 1652, and then a second term from 1660 to 1677. And as governor, Berkeley really favored the diversification of crops. You see, Berkeley didn't want Virginia to be solely dependent on the cash crop of tobacco. So he tried to encourage a lot of the colonists to, to plant vegetables and wheat and rye and corn. But because tobacco was so popular and so profitable, none of the other colonists really took his lead, and Virginia became ever more dependent on the single cash crop of tobacco. Much more notably was Berkeley's policies towards the Native Americans. Berkeley favored a very tolerant and almost passive approach to Native American relations. Not only did Berkeley limit the amount of retaliation Western farmers could enact upon Indian raids, he also restricted how much and how far they could cultivate Western land. It was these constricting policies that ultimately became one of the major catalysts for Bacon's rebellion. Bacon and his followers leveled three major complaints against Governor Berkeley and his stewardship of the Virginia colony. The first complaint is that Berkeley restricted how much land Western farmers could cultivate for their crops. The second point was that Berkeley didn't help defend Western farmers against Native American attacks. And the third is that Berkeley's restrictive trade policies hurt the Western farmer while favoring the emerging planter elite on the Eastern coast. In the 1670s, Western farmers were facing economic hardship because of declining tobacco prices. Western farmers had not diversified their crops, so they were dependent upon the success of the single crop of tobacco for their livelihood. And when tobacco prices started to decline in the 1670s, they wanted to push west to cultivate more land for tobacco so that they could sell more tobacco and make more money. However, the more farmers pushed west, the more they would get in conflicts with Native Americans. And these conflicts were both expensive and destructive. So Governor Berkeley decided to limit the amount of land Western farmers could cultivate to minimize Indian retaliation. Now Bacon and his followers saw these restrictive land policies as favoring the Eastern coastal planters that had already established large plantations. And the restrictive land policies allowed the larger plantations to insulate themselves from competition from Western farmers and also maintain higher tobacco prices because the supply would be lower. Governor Berkeley also placed on restrictive trade policies which favored the already established planters in the Tidewater region of Chesapeake Bay and the Carolinas. These restrictive trade policies hurt the Western farmers much more than they did the Eastern farmers because the Eastern farmers already had established plantations and established livelihoods. And on top of all that, the English Parliament continued to enact mercantilist policies. These restrictive mercantilist trade policies required colonies like Virginia, which shipped 10 million pounds of tobacco annually, to ship their tobacco on English ships sailed by English sailors to English merchants which set the price. In limiting the trade only on English ships with English sailors to English merchants did not allow the Western farmers to get a fair market value for their crop. Now, these restrictive policies didn't have the biggest impact on the established planter elite in the East because they already had large plantations. But the policies hurt most the Western farmer because they had 
fewer lands, and they were much more reliant on a good crop season in order to make ends meet. So the only way Western farmers could get a strong foothold is by cultivating more land, which means they had to continue to push west into Indian territory. And the more these Western farmers pushed west, the more they became at odds with Governor Berkeley and his policies. So why was Berkeley so opposed to Western farmers pushing west, cultivating more land, and shipping more product back to England? It would seem common to think that the more the economy grew in Virginia, the better everyone would be. But the reason Berkeley was opposed to Western expansion is his political power base was made up of the emerging planter elite, which had already been established along the eastern side of the colony. And westward expansion was not in the economic interest of this emerging planter elite on the eastern side of the colony, because they were already established. So they didn't want farmers pushing out west, only to cultivate more land and become more competition for their tobacco plantations. Not only did western expansion harm the economic interest of Governor Berkeley's political base, that westward expansion and its Indian conflicts was extremely destructive and expensive. Governor Berkeley and his supporters didn't want to pay the cost of western protection only to harm their own economic interest. It was a lose-lose proposition for them, and so they created policies which restricted western land cultivation and encouraged restrictive trade policies. And Bacon and his followers saw these actions by Berkeley as corrupt because he was not allowing western farmers to pursue their own economic interests. Rather, Berkeley was just protecting Berkeley's own economic interest and the economic interest of his political base. As a result of all this, Bacon and his followers levied corruption against Governor Berkeley and the House of Burgess. And these charges would lead to a battle for political control between the two strong-willed men. Berkeley's refusal to sanction retaliation against local tribes led Bacon to create his own militia and defy Berkeley's orders. Bacon's rebellion had begun, and it began by Bacon leading a growing army against Native American tribes, and he quickly gained the reputation as the protector of the Western farmer. At the same time, a new House of Burgess was being elected, many of which were supportive of Bacon and his reforms. So this new House of Burgess began enacting sweeping reforms. The two most notable reforms is the strict limitation on the powers of the governor, as well as the restoration of voting rights by non-landholding free white males. Sensing the time was right, Bacon led his army into Jamestown and demanded a military commission from Berkeley. Berkeley denied this commission, which only enraged Bacon and his followers more. In July of 1676, Bacon issued the Declaration of the People of Virginia, which criticized Berkeley's ability to protect the Western farmers and of his restrictive trade policy. The Declaration also accused Berkeley of mismanagement and corruption within the government. Now, these charges would ultimately lead to conflicts between Bacon's followers and Berkeley's followers over the next several months. And then, September 19, 1676, Bacon and his followers captured the city of Jamestown. Not confident in their ability to hold the town for long, Bacon and his followers burned Jamestown on September 19, 1676. Unfortunately for Bacon, he fell ill with dysentery and typhus and died just one month after the burning of Jamestown. And Governor Berkeley, following the death of Bacon, was able to seize the estates of Bacon's most prominent supporters and eventually hung 23 of Bacon's followers. Berkeley's seizure of the estates and his hanging of the 23 followers reestablished Berkeley's governance over the Virginia colony. Bacon's rebellion, although short-lived and unsuccessful, did leave three legacies to look back on. The first legacy was the rise of the Western farmer or the poorer farmer against the established, more wealthy class. You see, the European aristocracy had been solidified, and society throughout Europe just accepted that you had poor farmers and you had rich farmers. But in America, that caste system was going to be challenged. The Western farmer demonstrated through Bacon's Rebellion that equal access to economic and political opportunity was something they were going to fight for. In Culpeper's Rebellion in 1677, just one year after Bacon's in the Carolina colonies, further reinforced that the Western farmer was not going to be a second-class citizen in the American colonies. Secondly, while not a direct catalyst for the American Revolution, Bacon's Rebellion and the American Revolution share some notable similarities. Both Bacon and his followers and the American revolutionaries felt that their current system of government had excessive taxes, a lack of representation of their interest in the legislative body, and generally oppressive legislation. However, while similarities exist, historians are not quick to make uh, too strong of parallels between Bacon's Rebellion and the American Revolution, simply because they were 100 years apart, and Bacon's Rebellion focused on the conflict between two personalities, Bacon and Berkeley, whereas the American Revolution didn't have outsized personalities 
leading both fights. And the third and perhaps most important legacy was the shift from the indentured servant labor system to the African slave labor system in the American colonies. Much of the Virginia colony and the southern colonies required labor-intensive agriculture to be profitable. And Bacon's Rebellion and Culpeper's Rebellion showed that the indentured servant model created an unruly class of labor. So to help get cheaper labor and maintain control over their labor system, the aristocracy and large plantation holders in the American colonies started importing African slave labor. So Bacon's Rebellion had a lot of impact and foreshadowed a lot of change in the new American system and the American culture that was going to take place. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below and also make sure to subscribe to our channel.